Welcome to another episode of Saints Unscripted. This one is a little different because I look like a gamer and I feel like a gamer. It's kind of cool. We've got uh, a guest on the show today. His name is Brett McDonald. And yeah, Brett, you're in, are you in California? Yeah, Southern California. Southern California. So we're on a, a call with him online. And uh, I'm very excited for this episode because Brett doesn't know this, but I am a big fan of his YouTube channel, LDS Truth Claims. We're super excited to have you. I've kind of been a behind the scenes fan for a while. And uh, what I like about your channel is just that like, it's not like for us, we've got this whole set and, you know, we're trying to be funny and stuff, but like for you, like you're not trying to be flashy. It's very raw. You're just there with a TV screen with slides on it and you're just giving people the information. It's it's almost the op- like I said it's the opposite approach where um, I'm gonna try and bore you a little bit and it, there, it, it's like a tough love approach like if you really wanna you really wanna understand these things like I'm not gonna I, I yeah you're you're right and and partly that's because I'm not very uh, uh, artistic and and good at those good at those things and and partly it's because just the nature of it so you're right it, it's um it can be my wife always says the first one's the most difficult. Uh, session it's all about epistemology and, and philosophy which I loved but she thought it was like so boring she's like she always tells people get through the first one and then it gets better but um, but yeah it, it's a it, it takes a certain type of person um, but uh, we all learn a different way so yeah. I think it's all right great so uh, I want to talk today about uh, an extremely controversial topic uh, and that is some of the criticisms related to Joseph Smith and Freemasonry and I know that uh, you have, at least one video on your channel about this. And I've seen it, uh, I think, more than once. Um, We don't have a ton of time to talk about it right now, so I would redirect anyone with, uh, in our audience with uh, deeper questions about this to check out his video on it. We'll put a link to to it in the description uh, because that's a solid, you know, 50 minutes or so of really good information. But just to jump right in, um, Brett... So one of the major criticisms of Joseph Smith is that because there are so many specific similarities with Freemasonry in our temple ceremonies, specifically the endowment ceremony, um, Joseph's claim that the ceremony was of divine origin or revealed to him by God, uh, a lot of people assume that must be false and he must have just plagiarized things from Masonry. What's your take on that? Can you tell me specifically anything the uh, the the ideas that uh, you would say or when you talk to people they say are plagiarized? Well, there's so so there's obviously a difference between um, like the endowment ordinance per se and the presentation of the endowment or just kind of the uh, I mean it is a a, a the, theatrical presentation to a certain extent. And there are a lot of similarities in the theatricality about it, but I think what is more concerning to people are the specific, you know, signs or or things that we do in the ordinances that concern people. Yeah, it's what's what's really interesting, and the reason I asked you that question is that um, it, it I couldn't do this in my presentations, but when I talk to folks individually, um, I really like to ask questions because um, oftentimes what I find is that maybe they've literally like I don't know read a website. Or something, um, and and so what concerns me is um, is a lack of understanding about both topics, both both where the temple came from and masonry, mm-hmm. um, and so it's really difficult sometimes to even have a a conversation with with people because um, you're operating so, on different foundations. Uh, totally, premises. totally different way. So, so for instance, why is it? Do you think that this was not a criticism of the early church? So Joseph Smith. Two months after being elevated to a master mason, um, does the first endowment in the same place where he was initiated as a mason. Now, why is it, do you think, that all those early p- people that went through both, because there was tons of crossover, um, you know, the masons got angry at the Mormons because too many of them were becoming masons, um, and that there was a schism for about 100 years there between the, the two organizations. But um, there was massive amounts of, of church members that were becoming Masons and then also going through Joseph's temple initiation. So so the question is, the people that were closest to both 
um, to both traditions, why is it that they had no concern over the idea of, uh, you know, of, of Joseph presenting his, uh, his endowment? And I would suggest the reason they had no concern, and this concern comes later from people that have really no understanding of either, of either tradition, um, is that Joseph's, Joseph's initiation is clearly a response to masonry. Um, but that was really the nature of all of his revelation, right? So think about how we get the book of Abraham, right? Mm-hmm. Book of Abraham, he, he's intrigued by these mummies and, and scrolls that he finds, and boom, he, he produces the book of Abraham. How do we get the book of Moses, and particularly the book of Enoch uh, that we have in our, uh, in our uh, Pearl of Great Price? Well, he's retranslating the Old Testament, and boom, out comes, you know, a, a portion of the book of Enoch. Mm-hmm. So, Similarly, the, the, the same thing happens with the first vision. He has a question about this other thing, and then boom, the restoration yeah. comes from it. So, so the first idea, the first, the first concept is just this, this idea of what, we, what do we mean by revelation? Is, is revelation in our tradition, does it happen that, you know, God, whatever divine being, just shows up on someone's doorstep that has no interest in anything, right? And he's like, here, here it is. Well, in our tradition, that's really not what we see at all. In fact, what we see is this dialogue between humans and and the divine. I, I would point to even the mistakes in our tradition, like the priesthood ban, which was clearly you know a, a, a racist policy because the members of the church were racist. And what did it take to overcome that? Well, it took a large enough portion of people in authority to go to God and really, really get there and, and overturn that. In other words, often people say, why wasn't it immediately struck down? Why didn't God immediately come down and say, this is wrong and you should change it? Well, what we see is that like, we're largely left on our own to a large extent, mm-hmm. and that includes people in authority, includes people with prophetic authority. And things come in response to uh, response to our questions and response to our, our concerns. So um, again, that's a long answer, but I think it goes to the very thesis of revelation. If people are saying, you know, the, the the temple ordinance needed to come out of a, a lightning bolt and, and not be in response to anything. Well, that's just incorrect according to everything we see in the tradition. So the first answer is, look, nobody close to the situation had a concern with this. And the reason reason for that is because um, this is how this is the world they operated in. They understood Joseph to be um, getting these things based on his experience with other traditions and so clearly our endowment to me when I see it is a response to masonry, not a copy of it. So for example, we, there are some identical features, uh, five points of fellowship, for example, um, others are the symbol of the compass and the square you'll see in both traditions. And then there's similarities in what I would call ritual style. And I list a ton of those in pre- presentations that I go through. I won't go through all of them, but things like you know using a set script, um, imparting signs, scripts, uh, passwords to initiates. So those are similarities in ritual style, but we don't see I- exact similarities. There's very few, in fact, exact similarities. Um, uh, two of the grips are exact similarities, symbol of the company square I mentioned. Um, has it a name? There's some specific wordings that is. And then there's a lot of similarities in style. But then the, the, the two traditions really separate really dramatically. Um, you know, if you know about masonry, it's all about a murder of a particular person, right? Our ritual drama is about the creation of the world and and um, and morality of, of humans and covenants to, to God. So, um, so I just, again, I, w- I would ask people if they're dealing with these things, first to understand both traditions a little bit more, um, to understand the nature of Revelation a little bit more. And then really what I get into is um, Joseph Smith makes very specific claims about the, the endowment. He says these things were had agently. They were had before Jesus was on earth. He says that Jesus had them and gave them to his earliest followers. Um and we can now test that based on findings of ancient documents that we have um, throughout the word, in, world, including the Nag Hammadi and other Gnostic texts. So what I do is I say, look, if Joseph, again, take the critical point of view. Joseph is initiated into Freemasonry. He says, I'm going to, again, be, pretend I'm a prophet. Another way I'm going to pretend I'm a prophet is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal this. I'm going to add some things, change some things and say, hey, it's a revelation from God. 
But he's also going to make a very specific claim, which is that these things were had anciently. They were had in Jesus's time. Um, and again, another audacious claim. He makes a ton of audacious claims, right, from Enoch to the Book of Mormon, on and on. He's, he's even from the very first start of the Book of Mormon, right? He takes the writings that he uh, copies and he sends them to the scholars to get them translated, right? He initially views himself not as the translator of the Book of Mormon because he had no clue how to translate anything, but as finding a way to get it translated. So in the fraud, conspiracy, hoax world that we live, that we're postulating, he has to be so convinced of this fraud that he's going to make up gold plates. He's going to make up um, or appearance of gold at least 40 to 60 pounds. He's going to copy those characters and he's going to send them to scholars to get them translated. He's so confident in this fraud. So he's a very – if he's a fraud, he's very confident. This is another, another way he's very confident. But another way we can test him, and that's what I do. I go through – ancient documents from Alexandria, from onward and onward, and look at specific things um, and test him on it and say, Did, was this had anciently? And we find things, so for example, I read out in the, you know, in, in the class, as late as the fourth century in, in Jerusalem, so this is pretty late, um, I'm gonna read it, this is from 313 AD, so that we're, we're four centuries in, most things are, the, the church that Jesus had founded, if you want to say that, had schismed almost immediately. So we're, we're pretty far apart. This is what Cyril of, of Jerusalem, in his lectures, he tells new initiates exactly what will happen after they are baptized. This is what he says. You'll be stripped and you're anointed with, with oil, with blessed oil, from the hairs of your head to your feet. And, and then he tells them exactly how this has happened, how, how it will happen. The ointment is symbolically applied to your forehead and your other senses. And while your body is anointed with the visible ointment, your soul is sanctified by the holy and life-giving spirit. You are first anointed on your forehead that you might be delivered from the shame of the first man that transgressed, then on your ears that you might receive the ears that are quick to hear, then on your nostrils, then on your breast. He He's talking about exactly what we do if you have been through the washing and anointing and they're doing this as late as the fourth century in jerusalem so uh, the 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 levels of response would 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 go through that that type of uh type of uh, pattern right understand the nature of revelation and why the initial people that were going through had no problem with it because they understood the dialectic nature of of revelation understand joseph made then very bold claims that we can now test and then test those claims. Look at this ancient stuff and and see point by point was he was he right? Is he being proven right hundreds of years now later when they didn't have access to this stuff? Um, so again, that's a, a more general. We can go to more specifics, but uh, but definitely it's a response to masonry. We don't have to shy away from that. We shouldn't. Um, it has lots of similar styles, but only very few actually particulars that are the exact same. And then we can test this stuff and see if it's actually of ancient origin. Earlier, we looked at the question, why didn't the early saints have a problem with this? And one of the uh, claims that I've heard is that, oh, well, masonry comes from Solomon's temple. Uh, therefore, it's not unreasonable to think that uh, the Latter-day Saint endowment and masonry come from the same ancient source. Uh, but scholarship has since uh, proven that masonry did not does not go that far back. It goes back to 15th, 17th century BC or something like that, right? And so the question is, um, what do we... Well, what is the question with that? <laughs> no, I, 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 I tend to agree. I mean... Um, the early saints, Joseph was wrong about lots of stuff. I mean, he thought people lived on the moon. Um, he thought the Book of Mormon was a trans, he th thought it related to the whole continent, right? Um, like he translated the darn thing and he had, didn't really read it well enough to understand that it was like a very small, you know, they're walking like the entire land takes like six days to walk through, right? Like it's yeah. not, I, so um, he's wrong about lots of things. Um, and I think he was wrong about the ancient nature. I think a lot of most people were about the ancient nature of of masonry as a whole. I, you're right. We can't trace it back anywhere close to to Solomon's temple. Um, so so again, the the question is not is he wrong about the origin of masonry? Sure, he could have been wrong. Um, the The question then is again, um, does it matter? 
Does it matter if he was wrong about the origin of masonry? Did he take things from masonry that were wrong to be been taken? Well, maybe. And we've changed a lot of things in the temple ceremony too, right? So, mm-hmm. so it could be that um, is there a, is there a perfect temple initiation rite? Is that is that possible? Does that matter? I I don't even think the idea of perfection. I cover this in one of my lectures. Is a Greek and terrible idea that we should discard in in general. It, it's always an ongoing process. We just recently made I think wonderful changes um, that you, you know I, I are kind of specifically focused on uh, women and um, and their role and 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 how they communicate with the divine. Um, and actually, many of the things that were closest in, in similarity to masonry, um, for example, um, you know, uh, there would be um, penalties for disclosing of secrets, which the the, the original endowment had, uh, have High been removed. Fellowship have been removed. So, so I, I guess I would see it as like. Um, Again, taking it from a person that um, believes in in Joseph's uh, prophetic gift, I would say, look, he had an encounter with something that he thought was ancient. As a response to that, he receives revelation and produces a version of the endowment, which is then improved upon over time or changed over time. And we can, and hopefully we're getting rid of the things that, you know, that, that maybe were, you know, totally man-made um, and... But again, that's not the issue. The issue is, are elements of it historical, and can we find them in the tradition of, of ancient times, right? If we can't, if, if he says, look, I got this, and this was had anciently, and nothing matches up. We don't find hand clasps. We don't find signs and tokens. We don't find the Washington anointing. I, if we don't find the bridal chamber, we don't find anything, right, in any ancient source. Well, then I think it's a fair question to say, well— you know, he thought it was ancient from from the from the Masons. He was incorrect, and and therefore it was it was made up. But you then you you're, again you're confronted with this this problem if you're of that that idea, and that is we find this stuff anciently. So what do you do with that? Uh, you, again, he has to just get enormously lucky. You got to he just gets yeah. he's it, enormously lucky. It, it seems like a lot of people put a lot of weight on those. Uh, those similarities that we find while completely ignoring the things that aren't similar with Freemasonry that he totally nails. And I just think it's a, yeah, I think it's a red herring. It's similar to the debate we get into, quite frankly, with like uh, the book of Abraham, right? And, and I cover this as well. Like the, the critics, and I'm fine to have the argument and the debate. It's interesting, I guess. Um, you know, debating the proper interpretation of the f- facsimiles, for example, right? Um, and I point out, like, that does that's not even answerable because of, you know, the way that facsimiles are used between the vast time differences. Like, like what is testable in the Book of Abraham? Well, what's testable is the knowledge that he produces about Abraham that says this is, you know, this is what Abraham went through. This is, you know, this is the story. And then it shows and later up. Tradi- and later traditions that show up in the Testament of Abraham and ancient sources. That's what's testable. So it's similar to, to this. We're never going to, you want to debate the similarities? Great. I like, I don't care, right? Quite frankly, right? I, I just don't. Like, it, it, like there, there's, I could go through all the similarities and go through all the differences. Again, that's not testable to me because, you know, you're right. Maybe he copied 80% of it, but if I can find 80% of it, which I'm not saying that's the that's not accurate, but if I can find all that in ancient sources, then what does that mean? So, um, again, I, I think oftentimes we we are talking about the wrong thing, and I think that's on purpose, quite frankly, from from those that that maybe have criticisms. Um, I, for example, I've I've never found one critic that will engage me on the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch is the most testable. It, you know, testable thing about Joseph Smith's prophetic gift, most testable thing we have. He says, here's the book of Enoch. We had no access to the book of Enoch. It's, it's, it's talked about in the Bible. And then we find versions of the book of Enoch, you know, since then. Um, we can't do that with the book of Mormon. We can't do that with the book of Abraham where we, because we don't have the source, source documents. Well, here we have pur- purported source documents for the book of Enoch. And he's claiming to put forth the book of Enoch. I've not once seen a rationalistic explanation for the book of Enoch, not even once, not even tried by, by a critic. So, so the reason I started LDS Truth Claims is that we don't teach our tradition correctly. We don't, we don't teach this stuff from a young age. Um, and so I started with the positive case. 
And then I went to the negative case because oftentimes all we're doing is dealing with with the negative stuff and, and we don't have a clue about the positive stuff. And it's, again, for a reason. Who's bringing this up? Who is the initiator, right, of, of these conversations? And you can't just let people walk all you know, over you. Uh, yeah, you, you got to have. So, so, so again, I, I think it's the wrong question. I, I don't think it I don't think it matters, you know, what similarities there are. Again, I think it's interesting, but I don't think it matters. Interesting and, and relevance are two different things. It's interesting. It's not relevant to the question of was Joseph Smith, uh, you know, a prophet in this regard? That's a lot to think about. Yeah, because what you've done is you've challenged some of the very foundational uh, principles that, that this argument is based on, that being revelation and how revelation works and, you know, does this matter, does this not matter? Um, and so I think that's a lot a lot for people to chew on. Um, for people that um, are struggling with this, which there's a lot, um, what do you think would be the just just to kind of wrap this up? What do you think would be the the nugget of wisdom that you would give them, or the nugget of advice as they look at this uh, this quote unquote problem that is presented to them by critics? Um, I, it's the same heuristic I would uh, I would offer for any particular criticism, and the, and the heuristic I think some follows this pattern. Slow down is the first thing. Okay, o- oftentimes you're going a-, a little too fast. Your mind's whirling because the first time I've heard of plug me or whatever, right? So, slow down. Go back to first principles of uh, if most people don't understand first principles. So, I heard you guys talk about epistemology, and that's great. That's the first thing I start with with my lectures. Um, I, this is so super self-serving, but I don't like make money on YouTube, but. Watch all my lectures, like watch the 30 hours of the positive case, and then we can discuss if you have cont- more issues, right? Put in the work, though. Like people say, I, I talk to critics all the time, and I, I challenge – there's all these people that left the church, and they'll be like – like Jeremy Runnels, he wrote that it's a yes letter, mm-hmm. right? It's like fanciful, but – He's like, I put in thousands of hours of reading and I'm like, (laughs) and I'm honestly dumbfounded. What did you read? Because they they haven't read anything that I have read. Right. So like, don't you have to, again, there's lots of now good sources and I try and I put down all the stuff. If you want to read, right. I I have 30 hours of lecture, but if you want to read the source material, I have it all right there for you. So you got to go slower, go back to first principles and then work through problems in a rational way and not taking the hidden assumptions that people are giving you for granted. And that's what they've just done, right? They've given you a hidden assumption. If there's similarities between the revealed endowment and and the Masonic endowment, which we know is of recent origin, then it must be false. That's an assumption. It's hidden oftentimes, right? And you have to go be underneath that. And and you have to go slower. We're good at giving ourselves those same, those hidden assumptions as well. Like when it comes to revelation or, or yeah, there's lots of things that we in the, the church, right? I think have uh, totally mistaken that, and that's you know it, it is it is what it is. So um, go slow, start at the beginning, reach out to people that you know that maybe have gone through it and have resources. Find the right resources, um, and 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 then you and you can work through it. Um, it it only takes time and effort. It really does. And if people want shortcuts in this stuff. Um, it just doesn't. It just doesn't work, and and you know, and, and that's how that's why the critics kind of get away with stuff is they can they can make a bite sized thing, and if if you're not willing to put in the work and understand the hidden assumptions and where it's coming from and all that kind of stuff, right? Which they're then then you might be confused. Brett McDonald, thank you so much for joining us. I really hope that whatever concept of a new YouTube channel or series you have going on in your head, I hope it comes to fruition because I love the stuff you put out. Um, thank you so much for joining us our audience please check out his uh, channel LDS Truth Claims there's so much knowledge there uh, and it's great stuff and he's got all of his sources in the in his video descriptions uh, I already have ideas of topics that I want to hit having you back on the show hopefully one day if you would ever I'm ha- happy to do it anytime this is it's always fun for me giving me a little break I run a, a esports company so you look like a gamer so I run an esports company um, and, and it gives me a break from my day so anytime love to be back and appreciate your time great thank you so much Brett